This is a nuisance case. We're acting for the leaseholders of four flats in a building called Neo Bankside on the South Bank. We've brought proceedings against the Tate, and we say that the Tate is committing a nuisance by operating a viewing gallery in a way that seriously harms the amenity of the client's flats. And it does so because from morning till night, hundreds of visitors to the viewing gallery engage in viewing, observation, photography, videoing, making obscene gestures uh, in respect to the flats. And the judge of first instance agreed with us that it was having a really terrible impact on the immunity of the flats. He held it was disturbing, intrusive, and a, a material invasion on the uh, privacy of the clients in their homes. Uh, and so we say in those circumstances, uh, the Tate is committing a nuisance. And we, we're seeking an injunction to require the Tate to prevent visitors to the viewing gallery engaging in, in viewing and observation uh, towards the flats. Well, this case will put to rest a legal controversy that's existed for the best part of 100 years in the UK and in common law jurisdictions throughout the world. The issue is whether a visual intrusion can be a nuisance. Uh, and the, the issue was identified by Professor Winfield, a famous academic specialising in tort, in a 1930 article. And he discussed a county court case about a dentist in Balham. And the neighbours, next door neighbours of the dentist, erected a series of mirrors to be able to watch the dentist at work on the ground floor of his house. In the county court, his claim in nuisance, the dentist's claim in nuisance failed. But Professor Winfield thought, in principle, there was no reason why nuisance shouldn't protect visual intrusions of that kind. And in the years since the article in 1930, most academics and judges who have considered the issue have agreed with Professor Winfield that this sort of thing can be a nuisance. But in our case, the Court of Appeal disagreed. Uh, and they relied upon four rights of light cases dating from the 19th century, in which judges said that it is permissible to open a window overlooking your neighbor's land. Uh, they relied upon those cases to extrapolate the general proposition that a visual intrusion, or what they called a mere overlooking, can never be a nuisance. And on this appeal, we'll be challenging that finding, or that holding. We're simply going to be asking the Supreme Court to apply the usual general principles of nuisance. And in relation to activities, there are three principles. First of all, if you maliciously interfere with your neighbour's land, that is unlawful. Secondly, the ordinary use of land, what is necessary for the common and ordinary use of land, uh, can never be a nuisance. So you're entitled to mow your lawn, uh, even if that disturbs your neighbour, um, but, but not at three o'clock in the morning. The, the third principle is that if you're not using your property for the all common and ordinary use of land, whether something is a nuisance is a threshold question. It simply depends upon whether it seriously harms the amenity of your neighbour's land. And that, that, is what the court, that is what the Tate is doing in this case, and therefore it is a nuisance. And we say the Court of Appeal was wrong to extrapolate from what was correctly held by the rights of light cases in the 19th century, that opening a window uh, per se overlooking your neighbor's land is not a nuisance. They were wrong to extrapolate a general principle that visual intrusion, or, or as they called it, mere overlooking, can never be a nuisance. This case is important for two reasons. First of all, it puts to rest this great controversy that's existed uh, in, the, in the law of nuisance for the best part of 100 years. But also it's important because of how this case sits in the developing law of privacy. Now, privacy law has been in existence internationally since the second half of the 19th century. And protection of privacy was brought into domestic law by Article 8 of the European Convention. And Parliament, when enacting the Human Rights Act, envisaged that the courts would give effect to that Article 8 right to privacy by developing existing torts like nuisance. And there's been a big debate about how that would happen, how the horizontal impact of the Convention 
would operate. And the Court of Appeal in this case thought that nuisance could be a vehicle for Article 8 rights only if it precisely mirrored the test under Article 8. We said that was wrong. And if, if contrary to our primary case, uh, if nuisance otherwise wouldn't provide a protection against visual intrusion, we say Article 8 requires a minor modification of the principles of nuisance to allow in a limited range of cases uh, liability in the case of, of visual intrusion.